Well, I found some more hard drives to, to leak and clear up. I thought, shall I put them up? Shall I not put them up? But, of course, once you start looking at a few clips, it sort of takes you back and you think, oh, I really enjoyed that day. So here's a few clips of a bit of tote fishing I did out in High Sea Drifter, Man Alone series, and Man Alive was the fishing good. Well, I've got a fish on, guys. It's a good fish, but there's such a huge run of tide. I'm having trouble with it, even on a 20, 30 pound boat run. It might be a small tote. But he's giving me a hell of a scrap. Well, basically, the big lead and the fish and the tide is giving me the scrap. I've got no choice. Looks like a small tote, is it? No, it's a big, smooth out. They're actually planing in this current. Might fall off, but it's, it's a real chunky one. Come on. I don't want him tangling up in the chunk bag. Yeah, it's a nice one. Holy smoly, I better clip the lead off of this. Anchor is ripping here in the current. Doubt that you can hear it. Oh! There we go, guys. Totally awesome. This is the rarest commodity, guys, I've got here. The tide's ripping so much, I thought I'd put a set of feathers out and just leave them spinning and flapping in the tide. And was that a bonus? Oh, what? Only a full string. Watch them all fall off. Oh, 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 oh I've run out of feathers. <laughs> Look at this. I haven't got any more feathers. One, two, three, four, five, six. Fall in the water. Seven chunking great mackerel. That could give me a shot at a tote. Do you know what? I'm going to eat some of those and the rest are, he said, falling over. Bait. That is a rarity. And that is fishing straight into the chum bag trail. Does it work? People ask me why I use chum all the time. That's why Ooh. feathers people are the ones tied up by Frank uh, Vinicum down in Falmouth. He does commercial, we used to do years ago, he's 90 odd years old. Top Mako shark contact, Frank is. And obviously, Makos eat mackerel. Frank catches mackerel for a living. Obviously, he knows a bit about catching commercial fish. And I put these feathers down. There's commercial ones that he uses on the Great Big Week, 28 at a set. I just put them down with one of these longer leads because I find that these longer leads were sort of in a ripping coming like this would just wiggle and flash and sometimes I've wrapped silver paper around it other times I've got a knife and I've actually scratched that lead clean to give it a bit of flash so I've got it right in the line of the chum bag and I'm a happy bunny because I've now got a fresh bait for tote and in that chum bag if I can stand up uh, in that chum trail I've got my sharp line but it's got a couple of sardines on it. It's shortly going to have a fresh mac. That's brilliant. Back right, let's get it. Man, if this is a smooth out, <laughs> it's something else. Oh, I've got a feeling this one's going to tear all my other lines to pieces. More drag. Trouble is if I put too much drag on, I can't actually remember what size leader I've got on here. Let's see if we can get the fish up and take a look at it for you. If I fall in, it's all over anyway. In this current, I cannot swim around the Isle of Wight and walk up to Lymington Pier. You to see this fish. Could be a lovely smooth down. I want to get some more of those mackerel. I want to get fresh mackerel down. There's a good chance of tope will smell it. Oh. Do so hate fishing with big leads, but it is a necessity. The bait has to be nailed right hard on the bottom. It is indeed. I'll show you folks. 
go people another fish I just hope everything holds still and I'm really hoping this tide does ease a tad I've got a feeling it won't up deep like this let's get this guy back guys and Mac we're alive again not so many this time huh. what a disappointment only four or five That's a little trick if you're a beginner. When you swing them in, there's loose hooks. Try and get hold of the lead and keep the rod top away like this. I don't know if my boat's big enough to show you there. So you, you've got it nice and tight and they're hung sort of sideways. That's the sort of safest way to do it. Then either there's a skipper of the boat, his crewman, or you can take them off yourself. Be careful with mackerel feathers. They have big barbs. Well, I told you that uh, fresh mackerel work. And that is, uh, I think, a fillet on this one. I'm on braid, which is actually, this is a situation where braid does actually have its benefits, as long as it doesn't go around the other line. It's not so much you can get away with a lighter leg, which you can. It can't be a smooth hound, not on fish bait. But it's a fact that stays in contact with your, your bait via your rod top, you get a better bite. I'm not going to say I'm a lover of braid, but in this case, I may marry it. Dogfish. Don't come off, please don't come off. Let's show the folks on YouTube what can be caught in your own boat down off the coast, south coast of England. I want to see this one. You know, I hate losing fish, you can't see. You're always thinking, what if, what if, is it, is it? I'd sooner know what it is or was. Hopefully it won't be a was, hopefully it will be, and it is. It took quite a bit of line off me, so my money is on Tommy the Tope. Target species, and indeed it is. Come on, babe. Come and see your Uncle Graham. That's that fish bait, man. They love it, they love fish baits. They love the chum bag as well. Not a big tote. And he's off. He just came off there. Take my word for it. About 20 pounds. Turn around, guys. Don't miss a trick. There, folks, is my mackerel rod in action. As we speak, let's get those puppies in. I'm just literally behind the chum bag. There we go. A nice thing. But keep those lines horizontal like that. Keep them tight. Especially on your own. People have got a really big fish, it's stripping me out. It's a it's a it's definitely a big tope. I doubt I'll get it. Try. Probably if you can pick all the other lines up. I'll try and get that camera in that corner because that's the one I'm gonna try and take the fish over the side. Hopefully the camera doesn't go with it. Right, move this one. Always shake the jump bag. By the way, I've had those two take that I was on the head cam. This will be number three, plus a load of Max. Two big smooth hound. It does not feel a bad tote. The thing is, a tote like fast current and you're sort of shot because that makes it really hard to get the fish in. Oh no, oh no, there's one on that one as well, oh my god. That guys is the difference between squid and mackerel for tote fishing. I've no idea what's going to happen there. Oh, we're going to get third time lucky guys. Definitely a fish. And, and Rivendell, this is a Coast Guard. Do you know where in Langston they are heading, over? There you go, guys. Beautiful tote. 
Tramp, Pam Rivendell, Sterling Coast Guard. Can you confirm no further persons in water and all persons safe? Over. In the water? That's not good, is it? This guy's going to go back in the water very soon. Well, that's a tote, number three, and the smooth hound. And if this weed stops her field, there's an outside chance of yet another tote. I cut myself down, guys. And, um... Just working the one rod with the brake as the tide is ripping so much, there's so much weed. And if I could just bounce it right back down tide and stay in contact with it, you feel the weed bead up, uh, build up on it, so I don't leave it down quite so long. And I'm starting to nail a few fish. This is on half mackerel. You can see how important those mackerel are for tote fishing. Yes, yeah, another pack fish. There we go. Get the lead off first. Finishing off the day, I feel. I might stop at another mark on the way in, but great fishing, good sport. Okay, got to use heavy less heavy tackle. Oh, bite on the other rod. Maybe I won't be moving. But look at that for, for, for a prime tote. I know they go a lot bigger, of course they do. But for ordinary guys, they're going to be delighted to catch a tote like this. Listen, you don't have to kill it, put it back, put them all back. They're horrible to eat. Great fighting fish, that's the tote. That arms are killing me, man. I've had two nice smooth hounds. I've had six tote now. So, the difference being, yes, mackerel. Unfortunately, put my foot on that tripod because it's going over the side. Unfortunately, although the weed has gone, I can now put the other rods down. The tide is dying. I've stopped getting the odd bites of the toad, and the mackerel have gone. So it's just a bit peculiar how the mackerel go, and the toad bites stop. It shows you how those two species go together. Anyway, I shall tough it out here. I've freshened up my chum bags. The thresher shark line's still out there. It's heading all the way towards St Catherine's Deeps out that way. So who knows? I'm covering every eventuality. Outside chance of a shark. And it is an outside, let's face it, it's an outside chance for a thresher shark. But if you don't try it, you'll never know. It's costing me nothing except a bit of time and effort. But I'm just going to tough it out here as long as I can because they're given the winds coming up to about a five easterly tomorrow. And that right out here for me is a bit of a no-no. Well, it's a definite no-no. So I'm going to see how long I can tough it out here. I might hit a mark on the way in because they're also giving fog and discretion being the better part of valour. I feel I ought to sneak myself back in early afternoon to be safe. Oh dear, I have a bite. It might be late. Spin it round if he comes again. Here he is. Tapping and tapping and tapping. Could be a doggy, could be another small tote. It is indeed a bite. Well, it's gone really quiet now. The tide is absolutely dead. I'm just swinging on the wind, which most people, when you're uh, in a fixed position anchoring, if you're over rock or reef, can get you very, very snagged up and you end up losing gear. It's not the best fishing time. So I hope you've enjoyed it. At least we caught some tote for you. A couple of nice smooth hounds. And I think I'm going to call it quits and go home because the weather is going to turn. I'll be okay, but it's, it's going to turn by uh, later on. It's a shame to go in, really. In fact, why should I go in? Let me hear you. Do you want me to go in or not? Because I've sort of finished a film on tote. I'm sorry, you at the back there? You think... You think I can't see you in there? I can see you. I can see you're looking at the computer screen. Your right hand's right near the mouse. I know exactly what you're doing. So let's hear everybody. Who wants me to do one more little stop and see if I can get a smooth hound on the way home? Yes or no? Oh man, that's sad, isn't it? Forget it. Go on, all right, I'll go. I'm going to wind in, dead tide. I know a little mark on the way in where normally you can get a chance of a nice smooth hound on the flood tide. The last time I fished it, it was pretty good on a flood tide. I'll probably squeeze an hour in, as they're giving fog and wind, all sorts of, and easterlies, all the lovely stuff. So I'm gonna move now, 
and that gives me at least 30 minutes I can do. It's on the way home anyway, so whatever. We'll give it one last shot. So I think we're finished here with the tow. The tide is dead. Well, I've anchored down on the other mark, guys. <laughs> I've had two fish I've missed, and now I've loaded up on one. I think it's on mackerel bait. I don't see it being a smooth hound. I'm another two, two and a half miles closer to shore now, so I've got less tide. Could be, could be a big smoothie, but I don't think so. Long fish bait. I'm so pleased you guys made me stay out late. If my wife nails my butt to the floor, it's your fault. I didn't want to stay, did I want to stay? I didn't want to stay. I was going home, and you said no, stay out fishing, catch a small fish, and here we are. Another time. I'll never get home at this rate. Ten tope anyway, I can't really be moaning today. But it's all your fault. Still got my bait. Just pulled off the hook, guys. No problem. Saves me unhooking it. Again, mackerel did the job on the tote. Anything left over in the water of a chum. a nice Thornback Ray, or Thornback Skate some people call it. What a day I'm having. I just, I mean so much trouble I may as well check him to prison immediately. You're straight to prison, do not pass go. Oh god the other rod's going, oh my god. I need a torch and a brain surgeon. Ah, oh, just gotta sit down. I can't take any more. My baits are getting hammered, absolutely hammered now. Boy I know what they are. Black bream. <laughs> Don't look at the left rod. The bream was just... There's going to be no bait left. Well, I do enjoy a bit of boat fishing, but I remember well a trip I had with Mike catching 30 pounders. Big, were really, you know, nice fish. Just drifting for poor eel sharks up off the dishes, off the old radar dishes. Loads and loads of tope up there, North Devon coast. Anyway, I also do, as you guys know, shore fishing. And for beginners out there, if you just start to cast, it can be a bit tricky trying to get the distance, especially in windy weather or a big sea or a big surf. Well, why not try a bit of pier fishing? Now, if you go to somewhere like the States, wow, they got piers there that are brilliant with tackle shops on them and everything, and really, really good fishing. Over here, fishing's not quite so good, but it still gets you out maybe a couple of 300 yards, and you don't have to cast so far. You're in amongst the fish. Here's Tony with some tips on pier fishing.
now Tony I'm fishing off the pier what sort of rod and reel would you recommend for say a beginner youngster or even an experienced guy you know if he's fishing off a pier he doesn't need the same sort of kit as a beach what do you recommend in the rod and reels um, what I do Graham is um, maybe a lot easier for someone to use a fixed spool very sort of like slow oscillation. I oh, was just watch that going up and down then. Absolutely so the guys don't know, that's but a spread of the line, the oscillation. The only yeah? thing against this, nothing against it at all really, but a little bit big, and I think people are looking in general for something slightly smaller and a little bit lighter. So, yes. you know, it's optional, but the one thing about the pen, it has got the slow oscillation, which is absolutely brilliant, you know, which makes everything smooth and it le levels the line on beautiful. So obviously you get a lovely clean cast, you know. What about gear ratios between the two on retrieves? Tony, uh, they're on those both two? about the same. Um, I think they're about six to one. So it's quite high yeah, still. Five and a half, six to one. And they're both about the same in the way of speed. Um, line, what, what do you reckon on line for, for, well, they for use, the sort of pier I, fishing? I think I mentioned in one of the earlier videos, um, they're using 10 pound fire line, if not 15 pound, 10 or 15 pound fire line. And, and a lot of people, they use whiplash as well, but a lot of people found the fire line, because it's a little bit more wiry, it doesn't tend to win not and it, it, it just performs a lot better. So they're basically using this 10 pound fire line and then sort of like, something like, I don't know, 15 or 12 pound diver sensor as the nylon. Yeah, Unfortunately, yeah. it holds a huge amount of nylon, it looks, it looks, but these yeah. spools are four ounce spools. They've got over a thousand meters on them anyway, so there's plenty of so, room So that spool's gonna give it a fill anyway. Yeah, and uh, you know, then what you may want to do on a pier is you might want to use a lighter rod. Um, you go with a conventional beach rod, sometimes it can be a bit heavy and it, and it just gives you a little bit more finesse, you know, that you can just play about a bit more, you know. What's that going to throw, Tony? What sort uh, of weight wise? They want to throw one to three ounce. Um, your conventional beach rod here from Daiwa, something like one of these would be ideal. This will chuck your heavier leads five and six ounce. Um, that's a fixed ball one from Daiwa that they do. That's a 12 foot, uh, that's that's a 12 the foot yeah. And what, what length's that other one, the first one? Uh, the first one's 12 foot as well. They're both 12s, yeah? Yeah, and you could also, if, if you were dropping down the side of a pier, you could use a 9 foot 6 up tider, um, which is a, you know, which up tied in for the boat. They're sure. 9 foot 6, 10, 10 foot. Perfect for dropping down, because obviously if you're fishing down the side for pollock, yeah, stuff yeah. like that, you don't want to... 13 foot rod hanging all over the side of the pier, all over the place, you know. And, and the benefit, of course, pier fishing is you don't have to punch out miles out like you do off a beach. No. You I can mean, actually pick you, where you, you want can, to fish. You, your other choice is multipliers, and uh, basically we've got the Akios ones here. This this one is their number one. This is the um, tournament one. Which The other one that I use, I've been using the shuttles, I think they're great, but I just picked a couple of these up the other day, a little bit lighter, and basically, um, they're like a 6.5 CT Abu, same kind of thing, like the, the rockets, all chrome on brass side plates, absolutely bomb proof. But what I've found with these on the pier is good, you can shut these magnets down and you can tighten the reel quite quite uh, substantially so it don't overrun. Yeah, so it's going to help if you're a beginner. It's you can proof, yeah. yeah. But too many people buy cheap um, multipliers, yeah. get themselves in a the right mess. And sometimes it's just better to spend a little bit more. All right, well, answer that phone, Tony. Sorry. Somebody want to go okay. on the pier? Yeah, excuse me. Hello, Tony's tackle. Yeah, there's a guy, uh, he's just phoned me up from the pier. We're going up there a bit later on, Graham. And he's just told me he's had a cut the place, a uh, few dabs, and it's fishing quite well. There's no bass at the moment. It's a bit flat today. Yeah. But we might pick up one. You never know. We'll be a bonus. Away. We'll be a bonus, but it's, yeah. But uh, it's not fishing too bad, so... We're obviously going to go up there a bit later on, aren't we? And have a give, it a crack, yeah. give it a crack. Tony, yeah, what, on, the, on those right. multipliers, what would you recommend line on those? A fire line again, or would you say oh, no, no, beach guys in mono? You, you mustn't use, you mustn't use uh, any braid on a multiplier. It's right. just a no-go. You'll get bird's nests, all kinds of problems. Um, you want probably 15 pound, 0.35 mono, maybe 12. And you don't need any heavier than that. It'll hold over 200 yards, 240 yards of 12 pound. Uh, about 230 or 15. Shock leaders off um, a pier, what would you say? You want a shock leader, you want a 60 pound grease weasel, which is, I've got that in the shop, you know, and that's perfect. Um, you want about four turns around the reel, and then not quite so long a leader for the pier because obviously you don't need it. Yeah. You know, uh, it's better to not, not have it too long. You might find you want to try a tapered leader on the pier as well because sometimes you'll get your fish up near the side and the knot will get trapped. 
and you might lose your fish as oh, you're God, putting them up. Oh, good, because it's hanging there. With a tapered yeah. one, it'll come straight through, smooth as you like. So that makes a little bit of difference. Well, we, if we get down the pier south, then maybe you can show us how to uh, yeah. how to rig one but of those up. I will do, yeah. And, uh, but basically, the main thing about these is these, what I was just saying a minute ago, I don't want to repeat myself, but too many people buy a cheap multiplier, they get all kinds of birds nests, they give up fishing in two months because they can't handle it. Get one like this with the magnets on, it might cost you a bit more money, but at the end of the day, you'll have smooth casts and it'll improve your fishing as well. So, I said go on the pier again, Tom. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Right, just going to go through a few of the rigs with you, Graham. Um, when we're on the pier, it's a little bit different. It's not hugely different, but I don't believe you want clip down rigs and have to cast to the ends of the earth, you know. Yep. Um, you'll find it's a little bit more finesse on a pier. You may get fish around the pylons and, and basically Sometimes you don't have to cast miles, you know what I mean? Yep, it can yep. pay off. So what we do is, I tend to have found on the beach, when you use rigs that haven't got clips, your catch ratio does seem to be a little bit better. Why, I don't know, because you shouldn't think that a clip can make much difference, would you? Yeah, wouldn't thought but so, for yeah. some reason, a lot of guys who fish all the time, if they can always get away with it on the beach, they'll fish a flapper rig, what we call a flapper, with no... No, no clips at all. Right? Oh, no bait. It might yeah, not yeah. go quite so far, yeah. but I don't know if it's a little bit more finesse, but you tend to catch more fish. Yes. And, it, and it's not a myth, because if you talk to a lot of guys who are good, if they can get away with not clipping down, they will. I've done so, exactly the self, yeah. that myself this winter. You so know, on the pier, I've tried it, yeah. you don't have to cast so far, so we basically, what I would basically do is I tend to use a, a slightly longer snood, so you get a bit more flow. Yeah. Um, even longer than this, maybe, you know, but you can experiment with it. But this is a nice rig. It's three hooks. You've got one below the weight. You've got two up the line. It's all nice and finesse. They're all tied with amnesia here so that you don't get any tangles. What strain's that, Tony? Uh, this would be 20 pound amnesia. Yeah. You've got your bait stops, which I think I've run through before. You yeah. put your nice lug on or your ragworm and you can push it all down right by the shank. A little bit of a sequin there, perhaps. You know, it might attract a place or a dad, yes. but don't do no harm. You know, it's only like a stop, really. Um, and and basically, you'll find that you'll just catch fish. You you, you may want to use half a lugworm as well. Quite often, you can go on a pier and that, you've got these great big lugworm. They're not that hungry. You know, they might be just picking. Yep. So you use a half a worm, and you might get better results. Yes. Break them in half, these black lug. Just a nice little worm bait on there. No problem. And you'll find you might catch more fish. And, and, and always when you get a bite, everyone seems to... I watch people, they jump on their rod and they start striking. Yeah. You know, when there's fish, there's fish. And you'll get one fish and invariably you'll get two or three. So sometimes it pays a little bit of line out and just... Yeah. Just let it sit. Wait a few really more sit, minutes, yeah. give it another three or four minutes, let it bite, let it... Let it oh, forget about it, perhaps yeah. go and have a cup of tea. Yeah. And when you're really in, you'll invariably really in three fish or two. Which is obviously better to catch two dabs than exactly, one, isn't it? Yeah. Now you're, that... take, you're actually sometimes taking it away, the bait, from where the fish are. Yeah. One's yeah. found it, they're normally swimming packs, you might get two or three. But I don't believe in striking myself, you know, unless you've got a yeah. cod or something that is your rod and slack lines, you're like a bass, and you've got to pick that rod up and you've got a real light mad and hook into it. So you're telling people really just wind in slow, well, nice and steady. You know, no, you get it's when more you get a, a question of when you get a bite, don't worry don't, about it. Don't leave it. But if you get a bite and you find your line all drops on the ground, yeah. which you. you Slack line. The, the fish has sort of tripped Pulled. the lead, yeah. and you've got to pick that rod up and reel like mags. That's a fish over a pound normally. That'd be a decent It's a good one. fish, yeah. So it's got to be so, a good fish to break the lead yeah. out, yeah. So if you ever get the lead broke out, then it's a different ball game. You pick the rod up, reel like mad, yeah. and get into it as quick as you can because that fish will invariably slacken your line, it'll get off. And that normally happens with a bass or a cod yeah. or a big eel, yeah. something like that. You know, you're going to get a, about another couple of weeks, you're going to start getting eels on the beach. Yeah. And they're big yeah. ones, some of them, you know. Yeah. So, do you still offset the point of those hooks, Tony? Is that part of the match scene? Yeah, same thing on the pier. Just makes them, if you just offset them a little bit, you know, you get a better hook, hooking rate and uh, they're really good. I, I mentioned that on the last video.
it's not a monster, Graham, but I managed to get a place in the end. It's sizeable anyway if it was in a competition, but not quite as big as Dan's, but that's what we set out to achieve, and I got one. Exactly. Brilliant. Thanks, in what, mate. A couple of hours fishing? Yeah, only a couple of hours. Didn't have to come for too long, did we? No, bad conditions, everything against us, but the rig works. Yeah, fantastic. And I'm going to put this one back, which is nice, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, if you're a sea fisherman, you know the importance of having fresh bait. None more so than the shore fishing anglers. They really have got to have some good bait. One of the best baits you can get is the ragworm. You can buy them from tackle shops or you can dig them. Here's Wayne to give you a few tips on digging ragworm yourself. Okay, this area is very, very well dug. Um, looks like a SOM, in fact, in places. Uh, a lot of commercial diggers get here. What you've got to be particularly careful about, this, this will go for any um, estuary or, or harbour where you're trying to dig for worm. Um, be aware of what's underfoot. What happens is someone will dig a trench. The tide will come in a couple of times. Now, that trench, you, you won't, it will fill with soft mud, particularly in this area. Underfoot, you're walking along, suddenly you think it's firm ground that you're walking on which it is all of a sudden bang you go down to your knee literally in claggy mud more than one person's been caught out in this harbour um, and it had to be pulled out by the uh, rescue services so just be aware of where you're going what's underfoot of course check the tides um, and tell someone where you are uh, better still go with someone else okay well Obviously I'm not a professional uh, bait digger. What I am is a hobby digger who likes to dig some bait, mostly try to keep myself a little bit fit. It's not really working at the moment, but I'll keep trying. What we've got here, a little bit closer into the land, is the maddies, the small harbour ragworm. Now they're ideal, perfect for the likes of golden grey mullet, um, obviously the smaller species, uh, thin lips like them, uh, uh, red mullet like them as well, so uh, they're a very handy bait at times, especially for the match fishermen, they absolutely love them. What you're looking for is a little tiny pinholes on top of the mud, and I'll take a spit over and we actually should be able to show you some. There we go, rich ground. You'd, uh, you'd like to have smelly vision here, because it's pretty, uh, pretty funky stuff. Now, in the top here, you can see all these little tiny ragworm, all in the surface. All these little tiny tunnels is where they uh, move through the mud. Might not be able to pick them up, because they are a very, very small thing. And that's what you're looking for. Very small little harbour ragworm. There you go. Hopefully you can see that little red vein straight down the centre of it, which will identify it. Now clearly, not really targeting huge fish with these, although no doubt if you put enough on a hook, a bigger size fish will quite happily take them. But there you go, harbour ragworm. And if you get a rich area like this, in no time at all, you should be able to dig plenty of them because they're quite hard to spot. So you turn over a bit of claggy mud like that. Now there's one there, for instance, I'll pop him back. But if you have a look in there, there's another one sitting on top of the uh, mud there. And um, all around this you'll see them. They'll be sitting in this mud everywhere, absolutely everywhere. I'll see another one just sitting in the side of the mud there. This particular area is uh, sort of quite a, quite a compact mud. Uh, mud, shingle, a bit of stone in it. If you go down a bit, about a foot and a half, you'll hit some chalky air ground. It's a lot, lot harder. The professionals here do big, huge, long trenches. I certainly don't have the fitness for that. But what I do is come along, I look for the bigger holes on top of these patches of mud, I turn the ground over, and uh, hopefully that's where you'll find the, the bigger ragworm, which is the ones we want for um, the likes of flounder, uh, place, bass, and all the other species that like a bit of ragworm. Oh, 
I had a nice big ragworm the first turn over and I've lost him. That's a tip for you, that is basically. As soon as you turn over a spit, if you find a nice big ragworm, then what you need to do is get him quick. Otherwise what will happen is, he'll be gone. He'll be absolutely gone. And that one unfortunately broke up a little bit, which is a hell of a shame. So that's just his tail, but that would have been a good size ragworm. Obviously, a wide tined fork is what you need. But in this sort of ground, you're going to have a few breakages because it's a very tight packed ground. Sometimes when you turn them over, you'll have no choice really. You'll find bits and broken bits of worm. Don't put that in. Don't put a broken worm in with your other worm because basically they don't like it um, and it will kill them a lot, lot quicker. If it's raining, take something to cover your bucket. Don't want fresh water getting in on, on these ragworm. Again, it will kill them pretty quickly. If you can, what I like to do, get myself a bit of weed, maybe a little bit of uh, grit off of the beach, even a little bit of the clean sea water, and I like to put them in that, just to keep them. Um, now, as I say, I'm only really digging a pound of rag, maximum, for my day's fishing. I'm not doing it professionally. The professionals will have a much, much better way of keeping them. Um, they sort of have uh, aer aerators and all sorts, keeps them alive for a long, long time. What I've found is, that they really don't like, is uh, big temperature changes. So if you can keep them at a steady temperature, uh, cool, obviously, not, not freezing, that'll do, that'll do for them. But if you can keep them at a steady, cool temperature, um, they'll last a lot, lot longer. Okay, what we're looking for here are the better worms. So there you go, you're looking for that sort of thing. Nice ragworm there, make a lovely bait, single bait for a place or something similar. They get bigger here, you can get big, big king ragworm, head hook one of them and uh, put that in the run you get a very good chance of a bass. But uh, beautiful bait ragworm, very underrated. Not a lot of fish uh, won't take a ragworm. Um, oddly enough, some of the bigger smooth downs from the beach come on a, a nice, uh, you know, good hook hook size of, uh, of, of worm. So uh, yeah, I mean, there you go. That's what we're after anyway. Decent size worm. And if you can get yourself half a pound, pound of those, give you a very good chance of a day's fishing. Underneath, as I pointed out, you've got the absolute um, original ground, which I feel, which is that whiter, more chalkier, uh, and a lot harder, denser ground. Now, the worms, the bigger worms in particular, can burrow down in that. I'm not going to dig it, it's just for a, to, to try to get some uh, a few bigger worms. I'm just going to take it nice and easy and take the top off and find out where all those uh, average size worms, for what I want, where they live. Because I'm just a hobby digger, I've basically got a, uh, well, have a look, six pound fork, right? Well, it does me because I'll break, I'll go through them like nobody's business, but it's adequate for what I'm doing. So we look for those holes, look for the nice bigger holes. Don't look for the casts. If you look for the casts, what you'll find in there are those. Blow lug. Ragworm don't leave a cast. They just uh, go down into the mud through their tunnels. So basically what you're looking for is the holes in the top. The bigger the holes, I tend to find the bigger the worms. So if you look for some nice decent sized holes, and now we're digging on the higher parts of this mud here at the moment. This stuff's already been dug before at some stage. The trench will probably be here, and they've put the mud over here. Over a period of tides, the higher patches are where I like to dig, slightly easier digging, and it's still a very rich environment for worms. And uh, in fact, Graham found one a moment ago with his first turn of the fork, so. Uh, in, the, in this spot, in this spot. <laughs> start digging you've got to be relatively quick because you disturb the ground and they move so once you start digging I mean I dug over turned a couple of worms over called Graham over to show him I've dug you want to dig in the same spot where there's one worm there's often more so basically that's why the guys trench because it's a lot easier to turn a, a spit of dirt over or mud over where you've already took one out so in other words you want to go like so and if you're doing it properly keep it all one side another one Turn it over, keep it that Whoa, side. Oh, holy cow, it's a snake. And that's what happens. You find the decent worm sitting in there. Nice boy, him. Almost made two baits, Wayne. Well, if you're fishing for certain fish, you'll make a lot more than two baits. But if you want to get a, uh, a bass, you'd head hook him, 
and just um, trot him out with a very, very light weight. In fact, if you could try to free line him out, even better, somewhere in a nice bit of tide. Over the back here is a couple of uh, beds where you've got a little gush of water. When, it, when the tide comes in, it gushes through. Well, if you can free line one of them through the battery on the other side of it, of course, waiting for everything to come in. They see that come past. I think all their birthdays have come at once. Okay, obviously one thing to remember, backfill your holes. No one wants to do it, of course you don't. You broke your back digging it, please backfill them, all right? As you can see, it doesn't happen a lot around here. Okay, well, we've been here literally 10 minutes, no more. Um, I ain't got much more 10 minutes digging left in me to be fair, but you can see what we've got from 10 minutes digging. It's quite a nice selection of worms there. Some are bigger than others. Got a few uh, individual baits there. Got a few smaller ones. So, in all, for 10 minutes digging, that ain't bad. So you can imagine here for an hour, you should be able to get yourself a good pound of ragworm. But it's definitely a certain satisfaction of uh, going out, digging it yourself, and uh, tying your own rigs, catching your own fish. All done yourself, can't beat it. Right, now these worms, I'm just gonna have a couple of hours fishing uh, on my own if uh, the weather holds. Um, now, if I'm just gonna fish with them that day, then really all I'm gonna do with these worms, find myself a bit of weed, cover them over. No worries, that'll do me. But, a couple of little tips, don't overcrowd them. If you get a few decent worms, don't pack them all together. Keep the dead ones and all the broken bits away from uh, the good worm, because it, it will kill them quite quickly if you do. Um, and what you want to really do is, as I say, keep the temperature level. I mean, I don't personally free, uh, fridge my worms anymore. Even in the summer, I don't do it. I find a cool place, which is uh, usually down the bottom of the shed. I get some newspaper, soak in seawater. I mean, usually take a nice bottle of seawater with me. That I'll put in the fridge to keep the temperature low. And I'll lay the worms out in a shallow tray and I'll cover them with the newspaper uh, soaked in, in, uh, in seawater. And that basically, I'll just come along every now and again, change the paper. And uh, that does actually keep them alive. I mean, in my experience, it's kept them alive for three, four days uh, with no issues. Um, of course, you can keep them in the fridge. The trouble with that is I find that sometimes you buy worms from the shop and they've got them at a certain temperature. You put them in your fridge, it could be colder. They really don't like it sometimes. You know, I've took fruit worm out that were healthy when I put them in and the next day they've not been in, in great nick. So shallow trays is the way forward for me. Another, another tip. Um, grit. Now if you can pick some grit off the shore, nice clean sea grit, put them in that. I'll tell you what that does, that firms them up lovely because at the moment these worms are literally like oil. You pick them up and they will slide and slip them through your fingers. They really are slimy. You put them in that grit and it just firms them up nicely, makes them a lot easier to hold on to, feed on the hook. I broke out into a sweat just watching Wayne do all that digging. Don't neglect fresh bait guys, it really can make a difference. Hmm, after watching Wayne do all that digging, this enough to make you want to go out in your own small boat with some small hooks and some small rods and reels and just see if you can catch anything at all. Let's face it, even half a day on the oceans better than half a day working at home. <laughs> Right, we've uh, arrived down in Brackleton Bay. Lovely sunny day, winds picking up and due to get up to a pretty much a storm in about 36 hours, something like that. So we're trying to squire, trying to squeeze a little four-hour session in here if we can. So we've only got half a day, 
So to boost it, when you're on a tight schedule like this, I'm going to be using, I've got my bait dropper here, but I'm not going to be bait dropping it because we want to try and get some bream. And if I use a bait dropper in a big tide, it just goes out in a big whoosh, a big cloud. And if there are any fish there, they're going to go all the way down tide following that big cloud of bait. So I've tied the bottom release lid shut. I've left the big lead on the bottom there to take it down. And I've tied it all up at the top here. Oh, I'll just show you. And in there, I am going to put some extremely rank and disgusting mashed trout, ground up trout and bran that's been in my freezer for about nine months. This is the same stuff we use when we go shark fishing. And I'm going to tip that if I can. It's all yucky. You've got to have bran with it. No question of that. I'm going to try and get as much as that in this little hole as I can. Now you can use a mesh bag as well. A small onion sack is good. That's also good. But what you want is a constant stream of chum. It's no good having one big whoosh going out there and it's all gone because the fish will just swim away following all that and they probably won't come back to you. And then you want to make sure that this is on the uptide side of all your baits. Now this is really, really oily stuff and nobody who ever comes fishing with me ever shakes my hand again for about four days. I'm going to get it over as quick as I can because I don't want it on my show any boat. I'll just hold it there so you can see it. I'm going to drop it down. Now you can probably see all the little particles and clouds. A cloud of bran and everything coming out of there. And yes, the wind is freshening. I'm going to get this straight down to see if we can't winkle a few fish out for you under not the world's greatest conditions. I'm going to let it hit the bottom and I'm going to bring it up about two to four feet. And that way, hopefully, the tide will act on those holes I've drilled in the tube. Fingers crossed. We might get some pouting, but it's black green we're after. Right, people, we are in. It's looking like a black green. Black green. We're on the squid. We've got two hot, two hooks on each rod, and being the totally awesome fishing crew, we've got about 19 rods out. Uh, the breeze is picking up a bit. Been here about 10 minutes, and the first black green of the day on squid. There's the two hook rig you can see there, and the black green. Oh, it's like they've got spikes at the top here, lovely colours, pretty looking fish, but very spiky. There we go, it's a grip, nicely hooked. See the squid just in his mouth here. There we go, look at the spikes on that there. You've got to be careful when you're holding these fish, they're, like the bass, they've got spikes all over them. But lovely looking fish, the blue on their eye just there, nice blue tinge on it. And good little scrappers on light tackle, we've got really light gear here. But hopefully, it's the first of many today. Fingers crossed, anyway. Yeah, let's get the bait out and get some more. Well, after Mike had that black bream, we thought we'd be really in with them, but we're not. I've put a freshen up in the, uh, in the tube, in the ground bait tube. But we're getting tiny little taps, really, really faint taps. I've put smaller and smaller hooks on. And the culprit is a pouting, and that's a really black one. So it shows you the rough ground that we're fishing on. Like a little bib, that one really. I think it is a pouting, small pouting. An excellent conga bait. He might be returned, he might not be. As we don't have a lot of bait, I'll leave it to your imagination what happens next. Well, guys, the wind's getting up, and we've had no more bream bites, so I'm winding in now, cranking in on an antique snap rod. You can see it's an old broken rod that's been glued into the butt of another one here in an effort to save money. Does it work? Yes. But with dogfish. There we go, that's a doggy. Three species, but I'll tell you what, my hunches still move. We're not getting enough bites. I'm gonna move down about half to three quarters of a mile, check the bottom out down there before this wind gets too strong. Dogfish. Fish number three. And it's another dogfish. This time on a bit of trout again, by the looks of things. He's taking the trout anyway, yep. even if the bream aren't. And he hasn't gutted it, which is good. There we go. Hooks out. Muscly little things. Feel that rough skin on their tail and on their back.
Well, we certainly had different species today. Not been the world's greatest breeding trip. One, that's Mike's one. But just about to pack up and a real nice big garfish. There he is. Ow. And this is called a hook in the finger. <laughs> and there's the garfish. So we've had some species, but do you know what? They've just not been feeding properly today. We don't know why. Wind's picking up. We're going to have to come back with some more chum, have a go at those bream. Meantime, let's get this chaffy back, get the engine fired up, and we'll get on home. And we'll get the other hook out of my finger. Yeah. In a minute. There we go. Mr. the garfish. Well, thanks for watching that. I hope it passed a bit of time for you. That's what I do them for. If I find any more clips, I'll put them together as a little montage for you. It just passes a bit of time, and let's face it, watching fishing is nearly as good as going fishing. Did I just say that? Hit the subscribe button, both channels, TA Fishing, TA Outdoors. Pop over to Mike's channel, TA Outdoors, see what he's got going on, and we'll see you people, hopefully, in the next film. Wow.